Good morning and welcome to Lake Ozark Christian Church. This is our digital worship service. We are now having in-person uh, worship services here on Sunday morning, both at 8.15 outside and at 10.30 inside, and we welcome you to come. We've made all the provisions we can to try to keep everyone healthy and safe, and so we invite you to come and be with us in person on Sunday. But if you can't be there or you're not willing yet to get out, uh, hopefully uh, this message this morning will minister to you. Let's begin our worship with a word of prayer. Let us pray. The most holy God, we wait here this morning for the touch by your spirit. We ask that you enter our lives today, refresh us, renew us, and heal us with the power that only you have so that we might live with purpose and enthusiasm and courage in the way of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Savior say, thy strength in me this small, child of weakness watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain, he continue our worship this morning, we want to go to the Lord in prayer, asking God to continue to be with us during this time of coronavirus. It's not over yet, friends. In fact, I, I just uh, read an article this week. It was saying that uh, the coronavirus outbreak is on the uptick once again, and most likely because people have abandoned the practices that brought it down to begin with. So we pray that uh, God would continue to bring relief to the world. It's not just our nation, not just our state or community, it's the whole world. And we pray that God would bring an end to this pandemic and to be with those who have suffered through it and those who are grieving over the loss of a loved one to this virus. We pray for those who are ill this morning and need a touch from God, those who are, are full of anxiety over everything going on in the world, we pray that God's peace and serenity would surround them. And we pray for those who mourn and feel alone, that God be with them and comfort them. We want to pray for our military personnel uh, stationed here and around the world, as well as our first responders and all those uh, that we depend on for our daily life. We pray God's protection on them, God's blessing. We ask you to pray with us as the search committee continues to search for a, a new settled full-time minister. And then if you have a prayer request on your heart this morning that you would like God to pay attention to, know this, that God is there with you and God loves you. So let's pray. Lord God, we ask you to pour out your spirit on us this morning that we might experience the joy of your love and the wondrous compassion of your grace. You call us children, you call us friends, 
You've searched us and known us and called us by name, and we are yours. Be with those, Lord God, today who find themselves in the depths of despair. Let your love bring light to their darkness and grief and violence, sickness and loneliness. May we hear the sound of your voice and feel the grasp of your hand. O oh God, in all the corners of the earth, pour out your grace because we need it. It's as vital as rain and as delightful as music. And we give you thanks, Lord God, for the symphony of grace that we receive. We thank you for your care. We ask you to hear us now as together we lift our voices in that prayer which Jesus taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. This morning, our message comes again from the book of Genesis in the Old Testament. And we're gonna pick up uh, the story of Abraham and Sarah, along with the son, their son Isaac. So here we are in Genesis chapter 22, beginning at verse one. After these things, God tested Abraham and he said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut wood for the burnt offering and sent out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and he saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he carried himself the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked together. Isaac said to his father, Father, and his Abraham said, Here I am, son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham's God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will indeed bless you and I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of their enemies and by your offspring shall all nations of the earth gain blessing for themselves because you have obeyed my voice. Now that's quite a story, isn't it? It is. If you're familiar with it, you already know it's coming. But um, if you're not familiar with it, we're gonna be talking about that this morning because Abraham really is an interesting guy. 
And of course, he's a, a major figure here in Genesis, but also referred to throughout the Bible. And he's claimed as the father of three major religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Everybody has heard of Father Abraham. But what makes him really interesting to me is that he's presented here in the Bible as a regular, genuine person. He, he was the kind of guy that, you know, you wouldn't meet anywhere. Uh, but what made him extraordinary, in my opinion, is the relationship he had with God in that he decided he was going to obey God no matter what. And that's how the story begins. Abraham uh, was called by God to leave his ancestral home and set off on a journey to a new land that God had promised to give him. And the promise wasn't just for land, it was also for a son and a family and a large family at that. Now that might not seem like such a big thing to you and to me, but for Abraham it meant everything because you see, Sarah, his wife, was barren, barren. That she couldn't have children. No children, no future, no future. So the promise of God of offspring meant everything to Abraham and his future. But there was a problem isn't there always a problem, friends? What would life be without problems? And the problem here was that, that God didn't immediately fulfill that promise. No, Abraham would have to wait another 25 years before Isaac, his son, would be born. And if that wasn't bad enough, this whole story when Abraham was at age 75, and 25 years later would mean that he'd be 100 years old before he actually saw the fulfillment of that promise by the birth of Isaac. You see what I mean about Abraham being an interesting guy? A lot of people hearing this about these ages would say, well, yeah, but people back then lived a long time. Well, that might be so, but the Bible itself, the text, makes it clear that what happened to Abraham and Sarah uh, was extraordinary in that they were well beyond the normal age of childbearing. Well beyond that. That's what makes the story so dramatic. Yeah. Abraham had to believe God for his future. Just like we have to obey God and believe what God has promised God will do. We're just like Abraham in that respect. We still have to believe God. We still have to wait on God. We still have to trust that God will do what God has promised to do. And that's what this story in our text today is all about. Now, if you go back and read it, you'll see that the years waiting took their toll on Abraham. And, and, and at times he was full of faith and at other times not so much. And yet he continued to believe God and he remained faithful for 25 years. And finally, he was rewarded, and Sarah gave birth to a son named Isaac. It was then that God put Abraham to the test. And this is the test that we're going to look at today through our text. You know, when I read this story in Genesis 22, I have this immediate and strong reaction to it. The thing that bothers me about this notion of God testing, testing people. And one reason for that is because we've all been taught that God is omniscient, that is, he's all-knowing. And if God is all-knowing, then why does he have to test anyone? He already knows what's going to happen. Some might argue, well, the testing isn't really for God's sake, because God already knows, but rather for the sake of the person being tested. Well, if that's right then, God wasn't testing Abraham to see if Abraham was going to be faithful. Uh, God, being omniscient, all-knowing, would already know that. Rather, God was testing Abraham so that Abraham might know that he was faithful? Maybe, but it doesn't make much sense to me. In fact, the text doesn't imply anything like that at all. In verse 12, God speaks to Abraham from out of the heavens and says to him, Now I know that you fear God. 
So again, we're left with this question, why does God need to test people? And you know, the church has wrestled with this issue for thousands of years, and I can guarantee you, we're not gonna settle it here this morning. Here's the thing though, the story itself doesn't raise that question at all. It just takes it as a matter of course that God tests and tested Abraham. And what a test it is. After waiting 25 years for Isaac to be born, now God orders Abraham to take Isaac out and offer him up as a sacrifice. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how Abraham must have felt? This is Abraham's son, his only son, the son whom he loves, the son who is the fulfillment of God's promise to him, who was born as a gift from God, and it's this son now that God is commanding Abraham to kill and offer up as a sacrifice. And what's just as amazing to me is that Abraham agreed to do it. He's going to obey God. There's no record here of any objection, none that I've read anyway. He, he doesn't question God about it. He doesn't argue with God. He just simply complies to God's command. And so we're told here that Abraham saddles a donkey, gathers two of his young men uh, to cut the wood for the burnt offering, and, and they set out to the place where God had shown him. And after three days of traveling, can you imagine? Can you imagine the emotions that are coming up and boiling with inside of Abraham? the closer they get to that place. And it's three days, three days. And finally, after three days, he looks up and he sees that place. He, he leaves those two servants behind with a donkey and he takes the wood and he puts that on Isaac and he himself carries the fire and the knife and they walk off to the top of that mountain, Mount Moriah. Yeah. The text draws this drama out by telling us that Abraham took the wood and he laid it in order, laid it on his son, and he himself, the fire. They walked along. Isaac sensed something wasn't right. He noticed something was missing. And he says, Father, the wood and the fire are here, but, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Good question. Do you think he might be getting a little suspicious now? And listen to Abraham's answer. He says, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. Wow. Can you imagine how Abraham must have felt? You know, it's easy for us to look at this story and read it without any emotion attached to it because we know how it's going to end. But Abraham didn't know. He didn't know what God was going to do. All he knew was he was going to do what God commanded him to do. Yeah, and so here he was with his son going to that place where he's going to offer him up. Yeah. And the text tells us that when they came to the place that God had shown him before, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on top of the altar on top of the wood. And then Abraham reached out his hand and he took his knife. And just as he was about to come down, a voice from heaven cried out, Abraham, Abraham. And that stopped him. You know, whenever I read this story, I'm always filled with the same questions. What kind of man was Abraham anyway? Was he a man of faith or, or was he simply crazy? You know, I know that today uh, we lock people up who make these kind of statements that they're gonna kill in order to carry out God's commands. Yeah, and, and by that way, what kind of a God would ask someone to do something like this? Yeah, is that really the kind of God we wanna worship? And I think the text itself means to evoke those kind of questions. It's supposed to make you wonder about them. But then the story doesn't give us too much time to speculate because there's little time to spare. Abraham had pulled the knife out 
and was about to come down when God stopped him. Abraham, Abraham, don't lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Abraham had passed the test. He had trusted God, and now his trust was being rewarded. And in verse 13, we're told that Abraham saw that ram tangled up in the bush, and he went over, and he used that ram to make the burnt offering. I bet that Abraham wasn't the only one relieved that day. How about you? And in fact, I bet Isaac was probably more than a little relieved himself, don't you think? And in fact, I bet that Isaac got up off of that altar and ran all the way back to those other two guys in that donkey. And can you imagine what he told his mama when he finally got home? Hmm. Well, we're not told any of that. But what we are told is how Abraham responded to these events. He responded by naming that place Jehovah Jireh, the Lord shall provide. Now, that word provide is all the way through this text. It's more than just a sense that, that God would supply this substitute sacrifice. In Hebrew, this, this word has the meaning of seeing before. Just like we said, God is omniscient. God is all-knowing. God sees before. In fact, that's where we get the English word provide. It's made up of these two Latin words, pro, meaning before, and video, meaning to see. And when you put them together, it actually means to see before. And so there's this play on the word see all the way through this text. It begins in verse two. Uh, Abraham, God tells to go to a place where he will show him or where he's seen before. In verse three, we're told that Abraham went to that place that he saw before. And in verse four, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. And then in verse eight, when Isaac asked, where's the lamb? Abraham says, the Lord will pro video, provide, see before. Verse 13, Abraham looked up and he saw the ram. And then in verse 14, he calls that place, the Lord will provide pro video see before as it is said on this day on the mount the lord it shall be provided so what's going on here what is all this play on words what is it that abraham saw and that we the readers are supposed to see well i think part of it is that we're supposed to see that god sees things differently than we do his ways are not our ways his ways are higher than our ways. And then secondly, I think this story is telling us that we're supposed to walk by faith and not by sight. How else could Abraham do the things that God was calling him to do? It wasn't by sight, even though he saw before. It wasn't by sight, it was what God saw before. By faith, not by sight. And then thirdly, the story tells us that we have to trust God. No matter what we see, we have to believe that what God has promised, God will do. That God will provideo. That God will provide. And we re need to remember that God is able to see things that we're not able to see. God is able to see before. We can only see after. Only after God opens our eyes. I pray that we all might have our eyes open. Listen, during this time of pandemic, epidemic, coronavirus, and we're getting all these differing reports. Some people think it's real. Some people think it's not real. Some people think the whole thing is a sham. Other people are scared to death to go outside their own because we don't know what's going on. We're not able to see before. 
but we know someone who can. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And that's the promise that we need to hold on today, friends. We have to hold on to it, claim it for a truth for ourselves, that God will provide for each and every one of us. No matter if we can see it or not, God will provide. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God, for your provision, for helping us to see what we were never able to see before, for making a way where there seems to be no way, and for calling us, Lord God, to a life of faith. Now, I know that sometimes that faith gets stretched, but we ask you to help us in those times to continue like Abraham continue believing and continuing to follow you. And for this, we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. No turning back, no turning back.